All right, so uh, we're recording. Um, Elhanan, thank you so much for, for joining me um, on this Zoom call. Uh, the, reason, the reason I reached out to you is uh, just because I'm feeling you know, very, very sad about uh, the current situation, the current conflict. Um, and, and you're on the ground there and you do a lot of work. Uh, just um, we'll hear about the work you do uh, in a second. And I'm just hoping maybe uh, this conversation can make me um, feel a little bit better. Um, so I, I know you from People of the Book. Can you, can you maybe say a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what this project People of the Book is? Sure. Um, so I'm a recently ordained rabbi, um, an Orthodox rabbi. Um, I was ordained in uh, 2000, September 2019 um, in a new Beit Midrash that was set up in Jerusalem for men and women. So it's kind of cutting edge within orthodoxy. Um, and I've already had one rabbinic position in Australia, which I did for the last, for, for 10 months, um, starting sort of at the beginning of COVID in 2020, um, around February 2020 until, um, until uh, the end of December um, 2020. And then I got back to Israel where I'm from. I'm from Jerusalem, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. And um, I've been back since then and have been working for a nonprofit called Rabbis for Human Rights. Um, so uh, People of the Book is a initiative that I launched in July 2017 while I was still a student. Um, out of the sense that there is no outlet for Muslims and particularly for Arabs to find out about Judaism, both in terms of religion and practice and in terms of history and culture. Um, the instigator to this was a sort of a, a short series of talks that I was commissioned to give um, in a very interesting initiative called Roots um, in the Etzion block south of Jerusalem, where settlers and Palestinians meet and um, interact sort of as a peaceful framework. And when I met the Palestinians there, not too many people showed up to my class and I prepared diligently um, with very highfalutin ideas about philosophy and uh, theology. And the questions I got were very simple and basic about Judaism from these Palestinian villagers. Um, they had to do with uh, practice ritual, like uh, how do we pray? How do we, um, what do we eat? What is kosher food, etc. So I decided that if this, these are the questions that some, you know, a few Palestinian villagers have, then there must be another 500 million Arabs in the Arab world that have the same questions and maybe more broadly, you know, a billion or one and a half billion Muslims around the world. And um, so I thought I'd give it a, a shot and start producing videos um, on social media for these people which is the best way to reach out to large audiences. And um, finally, I settled on a, an animation studio here in Jerusalem called the Dove Abramson Animation Studio. And they have very talented well, and religious or people with religious backgrounds who do the animation there. So they really understood the gist of what I was trying to do um, from the Jewish perspective. Um, and for this, the other side, the Muslim side, I mean, I have a background in Islamic studies. I have a master's degree in Islamic studies. Um, and I also um, used the help of some colleagues from my previous job in the Times of Israel. I had a, a, an Arab colleague, and she helped me do the narration um, and the translation of the videos that I was doing. Um, and we also learned sort of as we went along through trial and error, made a few mistakes at the beginning, and, and, the, and the project has developed nicely um, today. If I put together the number of subscribers on Facebook and YouTube, um, I'm almost at 150,000 subscribers, both on, um, yeah, on those two social uh, networks. So, and that's without putting in money for advertising. So it's very nice. It's organic growth. Interesting. So for me, I have the opposite uh, appreciation of it because I, at least um, certainly in the videos that I saw a few years ago, you did, you know, discourse, dialogue, um, for example, with, with a Muslim woman, and, and there's this, this sh cultural sharing. And so, you know, um, there's obviously, I think, hunger for that kind of uh, knowledge um, on, on both sides. Um, you know, do, do you, do you yeah. see that as well? 
Yeah, so that was that was phase two of the project. Um, I wanted to go deeper into some of these subjects, so I tried to reach out to um, a Muslim partner, and specifically a woman. I wanted it to be gender balanced, um, and obviously religiously balanced, because I felt like I was being a little bit preachy and one-sided in my videos. I felt like it was the Jew teaching uh, the Muslim or the Arab, and I wanted it to be a bit more like a dialogue. So that's what led me to uh, Fana, now Celia Jawabra, um, and she, I couldn't have hoped for a better partner for these series of videos, which I called um, Close Neighbors, Shachem Karov in Hebrew. Um, and here's something very surprising happened. I mean, we did, the, we did a series of eight different videos, both in Hebrew and Arabic. We actually filmed, the, we had a whole day of filming, and we kept changing clothes to make it look like it was different days, but it was all one day of filming. And, um, you know, I, I kind of spread the, the videos on my regular channels. I spread the Hebrew ones in my personal Facebook channel or YouTube channel and the Arabic ones on my regular, on the project channel, because I wanted to separate Arabic from Hebrew. Most of my viewers are Arabs. So, um, and then something very interesting happened. And I got approached by the editor of the Jewish um, page on Ynet. Ynet is the biggest Israeli news portal news website um and she asked to share and write articles about the dialogues that i was having with celia and uh i got i think about three of these videos uh used as as articles on ynet and it was a slow news day not like today and um these just regular simple dialogues between a jewish man and a muslim woman got to be the head, like the top headline on Ynet, which is the biggest website in Israel. So that was quite an accomplishment. And that was the first time that actually Israeli audiences, Jewish Israeli audiences were hearing the same messages. And I, and I, and I value that because I think it goes both ways. Um, there's, val there's room for educating both sides. So that's how I see the project growing in the future is by um, having a partner like that who could also speak the side of the Muslims to the Jewish and Israeli world. Do you see that as a template for um, progress on the ground in the conflict? Uh, you know, I wish I, I wish I could say I hope so. Um, I have this arrogant sort of thought sometimes that if everyone were like me uh, and everyone spoke Arabic and was tolerant, then uh, the conflict would be solved. So I think it's true, actually. But um, you know, there are barriers, there are cultural barriers, there are language barriers. And um, I think um, when tensions are very high, when the political situation is very tense and people feel under threat and feel uh, wronged and, and, and really in danger, like many people in Israel and in the Palestinian territories are feeling right now, then um, all of this work kind of goes out the window and things collapse and people go back to their most primal fears and, and you know, groups. So I'm a bit pessimistic these days. It's, it hasn't made me stop. I'm, gonna, I'm planning on actually making another video just now this afternoon after I'm finished talking to you. And um, I've been writing all the time and I've been giving interviews to Arab media nonstop uh, these days. Another two interviews tonight. So um, I feel like right now we're all in the service of, well, I mean, I feel like I'm in the service of um, trying to calm things down and uh, help put out these fires as best I can with the tools that I have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of the stress uh, as an American, an outsider, you know, reading, uh, you know, social media, for example, it, it's a very, obviously a very, very polarized uh, discourse. Um, and, the, the sense is that for, for most people, any, any gesture of empathy towards the other side is interpreted as like a betrayal of, mm -hmm. of your own side. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if, you, if you see that, if you can like, you know, maybe speak to that in some way, or do you, do you agree that's, that's a problem or do you think that's just, just natural? Um, I think it's natural and it's a problem at the same time. Um, it's natural that at a time of war, um, when the rockets are falling, and I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem right now, which has been quiet since the first siren we had on Jerusalem Day a couple of days ago, 
And then there were a few rockets that fell outside Jerusalem. There was no damage to Jerusalem at all. Um, and we've seen this before in previous rounds. Hamas doesn't like firing at Jerusalem. Jerusalem has high symbolic value. So if it can't, I guess, accurately direct its rockets, it's not going to risk um, firing at Jerusalem. I live probably four aerial kilometers, if not less, maybe even probably three aerial kilometers from Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, it's not going to risk that type of error, right? Um, but people in the rest of the country are under uh, the direct threat of fire. The rockets have reached the north of Israel uh, yesterday and this morning. And um, people are scared. There's, bomb, you know, there's sirens. People are ru running to bomb shelters. People with kids have not slept. Their kids have been sleeping in bomb shelters. So I think these uh, heightened tensions and this group think and um, kind of this bunkering down is very natural on both sides. Uh, and as, as much as I try to fight it with sort of a cool head, right? And I, I don't really feel like I can do that. I feel like a lot of things are stronger than me right now. Um, I guess sort of just the last two questions and you could take them however you want. Um, just is, have you seen, have you seen things that make you hopeful? Is sort of question number one and question number two is just sort of the, the long-term vision. You know, what, what are the mm -hmm. options? What do you imagine um, as a resolution, you know, going, what, what are we hoping for, praying for going forward? Yeah. Um, so yes, I see a lot of hopeful things um, from the local um, political level and municipal level, like, um, you know, regions in the country that have been calling for calm, uh, mayors taking, um, having meetings and taking photos with their counterparts in, you know, Jewish mayors taking photos and meetings with, with, with Arab Israeli mayors, religious leaders from all three faiths um, calling for calm and taking photos together. And today, as things are becoming very tense in the cities and there's a lot of violence that's spilling out into, this, into the mixed cities in Israel or cities in general, we see um, demonstrations and um, calls for sort of joint prayer. And people are all around me are sort of trying to organize and, and group in order to counter all of this because it's a very scary moment. Um, we haven't experienced this type of civil war. I was trying to think whether ever, but Israel was born out of a civil war of this kind. I mean, the first half of the war of independence from the, um, from the partition plan, the vote on the partition of Palestine in 47 until uh, the, the, the proclamation of Israel's independence by Ben-Gurion in 48, in March 48, we had uh, sorry, May 48, and we had six months of civil war between November 47 and May 48. And we had things that were similar to, I think, what's happening now. We had Arab communities targeting Jewish communities. We had fighting within cities. But I think since then, we haven't seen anything of this magnitude, which resembles sort of civil war. So that's very scary. But as I said, there are local initiatives to stop it. And of course, today we have a much better police um, border police uh, system. There was talk of bringing in the army into the cities. I hope that hasn't happened. We don't have something like the National Guard in Israel where you can send in uh, just sort of reserve forces for these purposes. But we do have police and we do have um, border police who are trained in riot control and things like that. Right. And, and so you're speaking the soldiers go in. Yeah. I was just going to say some the of the audience. Going, oh, no, yeah. it's very bad. It'll be very bad if the soldiers go in, but up the, uh, except for that, not too bad. Yeah. Like some of the audience might not know that. I think you're talking about like the riots that are going on um, sort of throughout Israel, certainly in Lod, and I've seen some in Tiberia also, um, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, it has the, the real the flavor of like a civil war, uh, which is different from, from just rockets, for example. Um, and much scarier. I mean, that's maybe getting underreported in the media outside of Israel, but I think everyone here agrees that that's a much, much scarier prospect. We've seen conventional wars with Hamas again and again in recent years. Nobody thinks of Hamas as an existential threat to Israel. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, the fear um, of to your own personal safety walking on the street, um, more so for Arabs, but in certain cities for Jews as well, um, 
is real and palpable and that's much scarier. Yeah, I, I wanna maybe ask sort of a, that question a little bit differently um, one more time in a slightly different way um, with, with more of a, a bend to it, which you can respond to if you want. What do you think Israelis or Zionists need to be doing to bring about peace with justice, to bring about lasting peace? What, what are some of the things that should, should be on, on our minds, um, people who, 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 who want peace and, and have that kind of you know, power? Well, peace is a big word, huge word that um, hasn't been used so much anymore in our political discourse. People have given up on, um, you know, the idea of political peace, which is very sad. Um, but peace is also a, uh, a real concept, meaning people can feel it. There's been, despite everything, there's been a, a very sharp decline before this in terrorism in our streets. Um, the 2000s, up until 2003, were much, much scarier years here in Jerusalem, right? The Second Intifada years and the 90s were much scarier, scarier years for regular civilians than, um, than now, really, or than up until now. Um, this, the sense of personal safety has grown immensely. And I think for Palestinians as well, for the most part. Um, so... I don't know, I mean, to make a peace deal uh, with the Palestinians, a few sort of political conditions need to happen. Um, Hamas and Fatah need to reunite into one political body. There needs to be political unity. There need to be elections on the Palestinian side. Um, we also need a change of government in Israel, which in the next couple of days or a week, we'll know whether we have or don't. And uh, there needs to be massive pressure from the United States on the sides to go back to negotiations. So the stars need to align in a very particular way for us to be able to go back to, to political peace negotiations. But on the personal level, I think we can also make peace in the sense of Arabs and Jews getting to know one another better. Um, people can find fora to meet and sit with each other. They can learn Arabic, which is a trend that's growing now. Um, I'm a big believer in language as an agent for peace and for change. And I myself am an Arabic teacher and sort of paid my way through studying just now with teaching Arabic, colloquial Arabic in Jerusalem. So um, I'm an optimist, generally speaking. I believe this wave will pass soon. Um, I think the society is bruised and it'll be, the, the damage to the trust between Jews and Arabs has been severely harmed. Um, but as I said, there have been precedents to this before. Um, people were walking around in fear um, during the second intifada and, um, things were contained and we didn't, we didn't slide into civil war then. So I'm hopeful. I'm still hopeful that we can contain what's happening now and, um, avoid, um, really the prospect of civil war because the, the conventional ceasefire, I mean, this video will be watched later and then we can be put to the test. Right. But, um, I think that the ceasefire is a matter of days, but when you stop the, the, the you know, the fire um, of the military, there's, there's still social strife and there's a fire in society that can't be put out so quickly. Yeah. Well, Alhanan, it seems to me that already the work you've done, um, I think has helped me and I, I know it's helped other people uh, just humanize uh, the faces, the people uh, who are involved in, in the conflict. And I think human beings have a very strong capacity for dehumanization and meaning mm -hmm. acts of cruelty and also uh, for, for empathy. And it's, it's sometimes it feels like a switch that can be turned on or off sometimes, you know, in, in some people. Um, and I think uh, it seems to me that the work you're doing um, is, is helping in, in the process of humanizing um, the people uh, on both sides of the conflict. So uh, I just want to thank you so much for your time and for the work you do. Thanks, Amichai. And thanks for those uh, warm words. I, that's exactly the goal is to humanize the conflict. And humanize right. people. So thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe. Great. All right. Nice talking to you.